بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد respects the listeners last week we began the reading and commentary of a very famous hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari known as the hadith of Heraclius today is the second part and let me just quickly read the beginning of the hadith as we covered it last week and then continue وبالاسناد المتصل مني الى الامام البخاري رحمه الله قال حدثنا ابو اليمان الحكم بن نافع قال اخبرنا شعيب عن الزهري قال اخبرني عبيد الله بن عبد الله بن عتبة بن مسعود رضي الله عنه ان عبد الله بن عباس رضي الله عنهما اخبره ان ابا سفيان بن حرب رضي الله عنه اخبره ان هرقل ارسل اليه في رقب من قريش I relates with an uninterrupted chain from me to Imam Bukhari rahimahullah who says Abu Yaman al-Hakam ibn Nafi' informed us that Shu'ayb informed us from Zuhri who said Ubaydullah ibn Abdullah ibn Utbah ibn Mas'ud informed us that Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma informed him that Abu Sufyan informed him that Heraclius sent for him amongst a caravan of the Quraysh وكانوا تجارا بالشام and they were traders in Sham في المدة التي كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ماد فيها أبا سفيان وكفار قريش in that period during which the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had agreed a term with Abu Sufyan and the unbelievers of the Quraysh. فَأَتَوْهُ وَهُمْ بِإِلِيَاء So they came to him whilst they were in Iliya, meaning Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem. فَدَعَاهُمْ فِي مَجْلِسِهِ وَحَوْلَهُ عُظَمَاءُ الرُّومِ So he summoned them to his gathering and around him were the dignitaries of Rome. ثُمَّ دَعَاهُمْ then he summoned, he called for them, i.e. closer. وَدَعَا بِتُرْجُمَانِهِ And then he called for his interpreter. فقال, he then said, أَيُّكُمْ أَقْرَبُ نَسَبًا بِهَذَا الرَّجُلِ الَّذِي يَزْعُمُ أَنَّهُ نَبِيهِ Who of you is the closest in lineage to this man who claims to be a prophet? فقال أبو سفيان, so Abu Sufyan said, فَقُلْتُ أَنَا أَقْرَبُهُمْ نَسَبًا I said that I am the closest to I am the closest of this group to him in lineage. فقال ادنوه مني So Heraclius said bring him closer to me. وقربوا اصحابه and draw his companions closer to فجعلوهم عند ظهره So place them behind his back at his back. ثم قال لترجمانه He then said to his interpreter قل لهم Say to them, إني سائل هذا عن هذا الرجل. I'm about to question this man, him, meaning Abu Sufyan, about this man, the one who claims to be a prophet. فإن كذبني فكذبوه. So if he lies to me, you belie him. 
فوالله سو ابو سفيان سيز باي الله لولا الحياء من ان ياثروا او من ان ياثروا علي كذبا لكذبت عنه لكذبت عليه if it wasn't for the fear or sorry if it wasn't for the shame of them quoting or attributing a lie to me I would have surely lied about him being the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is where we reached I've just given a very quick translation uh, we stopped here last week and just to recap in the 6th year of hijra the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had agreed a truce with the makkahs and that truce came to be known as sulh al-hudaybiyah the truce of hudaybiyah hudaybiyah is the name of the place approximately 6 miles from makka where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was camped at the time that this truce was agreed this is where he was camped at the time that the truce was agreed they had halted there they weren't allowed to continue so they had to return to medina this came to be known as the truce of hudaybiyah part of the one of the clauses of this truce was that for 10 years both parties the makkans and their allies and the Mid- Mid- the people of medina and their allies would lay down their arms and not engage in any warfare in any sort of armed conflict this also allowed free passage for people for the makkans to travel north upwards past medina onwards to syria sham where they were able to trade freely taking advantage of this truce and of this freedom to trade without any fear of being harassed or ambushed abu sufyan led a very large caravan he says that there was not a single family in the whole of makkah not a man or a woman who had not invested in that trade caravan and he was in charge of it it was under his leadership with approximately 30 of the men and he took them up north to sham and at that time they were specifically in the port of gaza gaza and whilst they were trading there in the port city of gaza gaza what had also happened is heraclius who was a byzantine roman emperor he had been engaged in a very long campaign of warfare with the other superpower of the time the sasanid persian empire and despite having suffered immense losses initially heraclius through his military capability and his political leadership he was able to reverse the tide and fight back the sasanid persians and actually defeat them in battle and in, in quite a dramatic and radical way despite having lost most of his realm pre uh, initially so much so that even jerusalem had been lost to the persians now it had been won back heraclius had vowed that if allah granted him, well if god since he was a very devout christian heraclius declared that if god and he was the regarded as the holy roman emperor and the byzantine christian emperor because it was the capital of the roman empire and not just of the roman empire in worldly terms but also of christendom so he he vowed to god that if god delivered him from the persians and granted him victory he would make a pilgrimage on foot to jerusalem and pay homage to god so he and thanks so because of his victories he made his way to jerusalem whilst he was in jerusalem since he was a scholar of the he was a devout christian he consulted with the with his clergy with his bishops and he was well in tune and well versed with christian scriptures and because of his interest also in astrology and soothsaying and fortune telling etc he realized and he surmised that 
many great events were about to take place. And in that period, he also saw, according to some narrations, it was a dream, according to others, it was his own surmising, but he felt that a prophet was about to appear, or a great leader was about to appear. Whilst he was in Jerusalem at that time, one of the Ghassanid rulers, these were Arabs, their allies, he sent word about the Prophet just informing Heraclius of the emergence of the Prophet And shortly thereafter, a letter also followed. And the letter was sent by the Messenger Again, he took advantage of this truce of Hudaybiyah to establish extensive diplomatic ties and exchange letters with many of the rulers in the region. And one of those letters was dispatched to Heraclius, being the Byzantine Roman Emperor. At that time, the most powerful person, because the Sasanian Persian Empire had been thoroughly weakened, and the dominant rulers at the time, or the dominant power, at the end of that war between Persia and Rome, was Heraclius. So he sent him a letter too. The letter arrived, Heraclius read the letter, pondered over it, reflected on it, kept it. And then he decided to make further inquiries about the Prophet ﷺ on the basis of what he knew from the letter and also what he was informed of by, the, by his Ghassanid ally, the Arab ally from the Ghassanid tribes. So he inquired from his courtiers and his generals that are there any Arabs or any of the people of the Arabs that this person belongs to in our realm that we can question about this man? So obviously at the time they didn't know who was, who was available, but they said, we will search. So he said, turn the whole of Sham inside out and bring me some Arabs that I can interrogate about this man. So Abu Sufyan was in Gaza, the port of Gaza, and that's when the soldiers of Heraclius arrived and took him and his whole group and hauled them to Jerusalem. There, Abu Sufyan, along with his whole entourage, the whole caravan, they were summoned to the royal palace of Heraclius. And this is where this conversation took place. So one can imagine the scene. This is now Heraclius, the Byzantine Roman emperor, the leader of Rome and the leader of Christendom. And he is victorious, having just defeated the Persian Empire and inflicting, having inflicted great losses on them. This is the dominant superpower of the time. And he summons Abu Sufyan along with the 30 others. They are brought into the royal hall. And there, in another narration of Bukhari, although it's not here, Abu Sufyan says, we were ushered in to the royal hall, the royal court. And there was Heraclius with his crown on his head, surrounded over here, the wording is around him were the dignitaries of Rome. And in another narration, around him were the patricians, the patriarchs, the bishops, and the clergy. So his courtiers, all the great ones, the dignitaries, the civil leaders, the military leaders, were all around him in this opulent royal palace, Abu Sufyan is called. They were made to sit in front of him. Then Heraclius said, who is the closest to this man who claims to be a prophet amongst you? Abu Sufyan said, I am. So he brought him closer. Then he said, bring the others, place them behind him. If he lies, then you signal to me, indicate to me, and you reject what he is saying, you belie him. This is where we stop. So Abu Sufyan says, 
that if it wasn't for the shame of a lie being attributed to me and my colleagues quoting a lie from me, I would have surely lied against him, meaning the Prophet And I ended by saying that Abu Sufyan, because the Arabs were close-knit and they were in a foreign land, so the Arabs tend to have this, or the Arabs then had this mentality because it's a tribal society. And a good way of understanding it is, even today in tribal societies, the mentality is, it's my brother and I against you. To the cousin brother, they will say, it's my brother and I against you. But if it's a third person, they'll say, it's my cousin brother and I against you. So, despite their inner squabbles, they were a united group. So the Arabs, despite their disagreement, they were in a foreign land. So Abu Sufyan was quite confident that even if he lied about the Prophet wasallam, his group of caravan traders would not let Heraclius know that Abu Sufyan is lying. So he doesn't say they would reject me. That wasn't his fear. His fear was that they may not say anything in the royal court there and then, but when we return to Arabia, in future, at any time, if any one of this caravan tells someone else that Abu Sufyan lied, even against his enemy, Muhammad the son of Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, this would have been a thing of great shame and embarrassment to him. And what that shows is that the Arabs, yes, they lived in a period of jahiliyyah, ignorance. But despite that period of jahiliyyah, they were a warrior nation. They were chivalrous. They had a concept of nobility, of dignity, of chivalry. And part of that nobility and dignity and chivalry was that they would not lie. Even against the enemy. They hated hypocrisy. That's why in Makkah al Mukarramah, the Arabs, those who opposed the Prophet, وسلم, they were open in their hostility. Those who believed were openly believers, except for the few who feared for their lives. But lying was frowned upon. And it was considered unmanly, undignified. That's a person constantly tiptoes around the other and conceals one's intentions, one's true position. So the Arabs would speak the truth. Of course, there were exceptions, undoubtedly, but as a nation, as a people, as a tradition, as a code of honor, according to the Arabs, lying was greatly frowned upon. That's why Abu Sufyan, even in this intimidating position, even in these intimidating surroundings of the opulent, powerful, royal, Byzantine, Roman court. This was his unique and golden opportunity to somehow win a victory against the Prophet wasallam, to damage his cause, to harm him. One word in the presence of Heraclius, the mighty Roman emperor, even if it was a lie, would have achieved more than what all the Makkans and the Quraysh had tried to do for the past 20 or so years. Since 13 years in Mecca, and this was in approximately the seventh year of prophethood. So for the past 20 years, what they could not have achieved with the Prophet, against the Prophet wasallam, one word of a lie slipped in, in that conversation to Heraclius, the mighty Roman emperor, would have achieved what they always wanted. But the very shame of having a lie attributed to him prevented him from lying against the Prophet ﷺ, even though he was his enemy. And as part of that code of honor, I mentioned that when Abu Sufyan's daughter, Ramla, who was married to the Prophet ﷺ's cousin brother, Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, 
when he died and she was widowed. The Prophet وسلم, who was in Medina at the time, she was still in Abyssinia. He sent word proposing and asking for her hand in marriage. Hirat, uh, Najashi Negus, he conducted the marriage ceremony. He even paid a very hefty dowry on behalf of Umm Habiba radiallahu anha. That's why out of all the wives, the dowry of Umm Habiba radiallahu anha was the most expensive. Because Negus and Najashi, the ruler of Abyssinia, he actually paid for the Prophet wasallam's dowry on her behalf. So he paid her dowry and she married him. And that was a daughter of Abu Sufyan. So subhanAllah, she's in Abyssinia. She now becomes a wife of the Prophet And he is in Medina. And Abu Sufyan is in Mecca. How must have Abu Sufyan felt or should have felt when he learns that my daughter has married my most bitter enemy? The enemy of my family, the enemy of my people. So, when he heard, he, how should he have felt? Yet, because of that code of honor, because of that chivalry, Abu Sufyan, when he learned that my daughter has married the Prophet wasallam, he said, she has married a worthy man. Even though he was his enemy. And this was a unique feature of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of his bitterest enemies, their daughters, their wives, their families became sincere believers. And their children and their daughters actually, some of their daughters actually married the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You had Huya ibn Akhtab in Medina. His daughter Safiya radiyallahu anha. Huya ibn Akhtab was a leader of the tribe of Banu Nadir. And even though he was banished from Medina, he did not rest. He was allowed to go in peace. But he went to Khaybar, and from there, he continued to instigate the Quraysh against Prophet ﷺ from Mecca. Later, his daughter, Safiya radiyallahu anha, married the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Sufyan's daughter, Ramla, Umm Habiba radiyallahu anha, she married the Prophet ﷺ. So... This was their code of honor. They could not tolerate the thought of lying even against the enemy. And it was considered a thing of great shame. And in all societies, lying is frowned upon. But, except in some ways, it becomes so normal that it's tolerated. And, but in subhanAllah, lying is destructive. It really is destructive. When a person lies once, you have to lie 99 times to conceal the first lie. That's why they say if you want to be a liar, you have to be a brilliant liar. You have to be a consummate liar, an expert, that you never slip up. But the amount of mental energy and stress that are required in order to preserve a lie are just not worth it. Lying is frowned upon and lying is destructive. It really is destructive. When a person lies, a person deceives the other. And deceiving the other, if someone lies to me, they are deceiving me. They are making a mockery of me. They are making a fool of me. They are playing with me. I trust them and they lie to me. They abuse my trust. I honor them, and they dishonor me and laugh at me, in heart and mind. They give me a smile of love and friendship, but in heart and mind, they laugh at me, because they know they are making a fool of me. They are robbing me of my dignity by lying to me. And that's true for anybody. This is why in a hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, it is an act of great treachery that you speak to your brother and he believes you and yet you are lying to him. So it's not just the sin of lying. He says it's an act of great treachery. And that's why lying is forbidden in the sharia. Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi relates a narration in his muatta 
It's a Mursal narration in which it's said that the Prophet ﷺ was asked, that, O oh, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can a man be a, can a believer, can a mu'min be a coward? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he can. Then he was asked, can a mu'min, a believer, be miserly, tight-fisted, bakhil, can he be stingy? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he can. Then he was asked, can a mu'min, a believer, be a liar? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said no. He cannot lie. In another narration, narrated by one of the other authors, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked similarly about other sins, such as theft. And another sin. Again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a mu'min can do that. Then he was asked, can a mu'min, can a believer lie? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no. Then he recited the verse of the Qur'an, إِنَّمَا يَفْتَرِي الْكَذِبَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ Only those who do not believe in the signs of Allah, in the verses of Allah, only they lie. What that verse shows is only those who do not believe in the verses and the signs of Allah lie. Lying cannot go hand in hand with Iman. They cannot go hand in hand with Iman. This is why the Prophet wasallam says, lying is a sign of hypocrisy. In a hadith related by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahimahumullah, rahimahumullah, from Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ayatul munafiq thalath. Iza haddatha kadr, wa iza wa'ada akhlaf, wa iza atumina khan. The signs of a hypocrite are three. The first one, when he speaks, he lies. Number two, when he makes a promise, he fails to fulfill his promise. And number three, when he is entrusted with an amanah, with a trust, he violates that trust. And in another hadith, again related by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahmatullahi alayhima, but this one is related from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, radiyallahu anhuma. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Arba'un man kunna fee, kana munafiqan khalisa. Wa man kanat fihi khuslatun minhun, kanat fihi khuslatun min al-nifaq, hatta yada'aha. Itha atumina khan, wa itha haddatha kathab, وَإِذَا عَاهَدَ غَدَرْ وَإِذَا خَاصَمَ فَجَرْ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم He says, and listen to the hadith very carefully. There are four things, four traits, which if found in a person, كَانَ مُنَافِقًا خَالِسًا Then he is a pure hypocrite. And if he has one of these four traits in him, then he has in him a trait of hypocrisy until he eradicates it, until he leaves it. And what are the four? Number one, same as the previous hadith. When he is entrusted with a trust, he violates that trust. Number two, when he speaks, he lies. Number three, when he agrees something, promises something, he breaks it. So these three are exactly the same as the other three. And there's one additional trait here, which is not mentioned in the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiyallahu an, which is, وَإِذَا خَاصَمَ fajr, When he disagrees with someone, then he sins. What that simply means is that if he has a disagreement with another, he does not keep that disagreement within its bounds. Rather, he goes beyond the bounds. As humans, we all disagree. Husband and wife disagree. Father and son disagree. Mother and daughter disagree. It's human nature. We disagree with ourselves. Forget anybody else. We disagree with ourselves. Our emotions fluctuate even about ourselves. Part of the day we may think, I'm so great. And then something happens 
and we're down in the dumps. I'm worthless, I'm useless. We all have our bouts of self-flagellation and navel-gazing. And self-pity. And at other moments of the day, we're on cloud nine on top of the world. It's human nature. So if our emotions fluctuate, our perceptions fluctuate, our thoughts fluctuate about ourselves, and we can't agree with ourselves about ourselves, how in Allah's name do you expect two people to agree? So conflict, disagreement, are all part of human nature. Islam recognizes that reality. But it's how you manage that conflict, how you manage that disagreement. And so the Prophet وسلم, has taught us that even if you disagree about something, you keep that disagreement within its bounds, within its limits. If someone has a disagreement with the other about some money, he owes him a hundred pounds, he's not paying up, fine. Your grievance is recognized. All your complaints, all your ill feeling should be about that one hundred pounds. There is no point bringing the debtors, mother and father, children and family into it. Keep the disagreement within its bounds. That's a sign of a mu'min. A sign of hypocrisy is, وَإِذَا خَاصَمَ fajr. When he disagrees, he sins. He does not keep the conflict or the disagreement within its bounds. So the main part of both hadith is about lying. Lying is a sign of hypocrisy. In one hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, uh, the authenticity and the reliability of the hadith is in question to uh, meaning the sanad. But when a person lies, the angels flee a mile because of the foul odor and smell of the lie of a person. When he lies, the angels flee. And I said earlier, lying destroys and speaking the truth saves. In a hadith prophet, related by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, Rahmatullahi alayhima. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, record, well, this hadith is from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu It's a very beautiful hadith. It's a hadith we should actually memorize. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, alaykum bis sidq. This is the wording of Imam Muslim in his sahih. Alaykum bis sidq. فَإِنَّ الصِّدْقَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْبِرِّ وَإِنَّ الْبِرَّ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَمَا يَزَالُ الرَّجُلُ يَصْدُقْ وَيَتَحَرُّ الصِّدْقَ حَتَّى يُكْتَبَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ صِدِّيقًا وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْكَذِبْ فَإِنَّ الْكَذِبَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْفُجُورِ وَإِنَّ الْفُجُورَ يَهْدِي إِلَى النَّارِ وَمَا يَزَالُ الرَّجُلُ يَكْذِبْ وَيَتَحَرَّ الْكَذِبْ حَتَّى يُكْتَبَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَذَّابًا Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an says the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said adhere to the truth for the truth, truthfulness, guides a person and leads a person to righteousness and virtue. And virtue leads a person to Jannah. And a man continues to speak the truth and actually search for opportunities to speak the truth. Search for the truth until he is recorded as a Siddiq an extremely voracious, extremely honest, and truthful person by Allah. Then he says, وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْكَذِبِ And fear, beware of lying. For lying guides to and leads, guides and leads a person to the fire. And a man continues to lie and search for lies until he is recorded as a great Liar, an excessive liar, by Allah. One lie leads to another. There's a momentum. Truth leads to truth. Lying leads to further lying. And there's no end. There's no end to it. It's always more economical. People say, we say, being economical with the truth. The truth is, if you want to be economical, speak the truth. For lying is costly, lying is expensive. 
in every way. And not only that, forget what, the, what harm it leads to in the world. A person's character is destroyed. And in that hadith, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that if there is one of these traits in a person, then there is a trait of hypocrisy in him until he leaves it. In a verse of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and what's the meaning of that hadith that if there are four traits in a person, then he is a pure hypocrite. Why is it so deadly? The truth is, these four traits, if there is one trait in a person, that person has a trait of hypocrisy in him. If there's a second trait, he has a second trait of hypocrisy. If he has all four, then his heart is closed. Lying is one of those sins which actually creates hypocrisy in the heart. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَعْقَبَهُمْ نِفَاقٌ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يَلْقَوْنَهُ بِمَا أَخْلَفُ اللَّهُ مَا وَعَدُوهُ وَبِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ Allah says, it would be good to understand the verse in reverse. So Allah says, بِمَا أَخْلَفُ اللَّهُ مَا وَعَدُوهُ Because they fail to fulfill their promise to Allah. And because of the lies that they used to utter, because of these two things, their failure to fulfill their promises and their lying, what did Allah do? Allah created hypocrisy in their hearts. So lying and failing to fulfill one's promises is not only a sign of hypocrisy in itself, it actually creates hypocrisy. That's why these are two of the signs of hypocrisy. And if they are for a person's heart is sealed, he is a pure munafiq. Lying is deadly, it's destructive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from this great and evil sin. And Allah makes us realize it's one of those damaging and great sins of the tongue to which we pay little attention. We pay very little attention to it. It's destructive. The Arabs, Abu Sufyan, even at that time, he wasn't a Muslim. And yet, against his enemy, he refused to utter a single lie. Anyway, we, this is where we stopped. Let us continue. So Abu Sufyan says... I would have surely lied against him. But in another narration of Bukhari, he says, but because of that shame, I did not. I spoke the truth to Heraclius. He then continues, Then the first thing which he asked me about him, meaning the Prophet وسلم, was, قال, that he said, How is his lineage amongst you? I said, he is amongst us a man of great pedigree and lineage. See, if Abu Sufyan spoke the truth. And the questions of Heraclius were very accurate, very intelligent. He had received the letter, he knew about the letter. He knew that this man is claiming to be a prophet. Now, he wants to determine, based on his knowledge, worldly knowledge and experience, and his being a devout Christian, and his knowledge of the former scriptures, he wants to know whether this is a true messenger or not. He didn't reject him. He knew this was something. He wanted more information. So every single one of his questions was designed to remove all doubt for him. And to narrow down and focus on the Prophet ﷺ being a true prophet or not. So he said, how is this man's lineage and his ancestry amongst you? So Abu Sufyan said, huwa fina dhu nasab. Amongst us he is a man of great lineage. For those of you who know Arabic, and are studying Arabic. How do, how do I translate a man of great lineage when he just says, 
Huafina Dhu Nasab, which apparently simply translates to, he is a man of a lineage, of a pedigree amongst us. As they say, at tanweenu lit ta'zeem, at tankiru lit ta'zeem, meaning, at tanweenu wa tankiru lit ta'zeem. I won't translate it because if, it's, uh, if you are studying Arabic, this suffices. If you aren't, then you won't understand it anyway. So, at tanweenu wa tankiru lit ta'zeem. That's why I say he is a man of great lineage and pedigree amongst us. Abu Sufyan spoke the truth. And remember, Heraclius said very intelligently that of this whole group of people, who is the closest in lineage to him? Because the relative will know more about him than the non-relative. Furthermore, for, for them, even at that time, ancestry, pedigree, lineage, bloodline, all of these meant a lot. So, someone who isn't from his family there's a possibility that he would attack unnecessarily, and as a lie, he would attack his pedigree, his lineage, his ancestry, and his family. But since he is one of the family, he wouldn't. So Abu Sufi, uh, that's why Heraclius chose him. So he said, indeed, he is of a great lineage amongst us. And without doubt, the Prophet wasallam he mentioned that himself in a hadith related by Imam Muslim, rahmatullahi alayhi in his sahih, from Wathilat ibn al-Asqa' radiyallahu anhu. It's a very beautiful hadith. Wathilat ibn al-Asqa' radiyallahu anh says, I heard the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Inna Allah astafa kinanata min walade Ismail. Wa astafa Qurayshan min kinana. Wa astafa min Qurayshan bani Hashim. Wa astafani min bani Hashim. So Wathilat ibn al-Asqa' radiyallahu anhu relates in this hadith called by my Muslim in his sahih and by others that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Allah chose kinana from the children of Ismail and from kinana Allah chose the Quraysh and from the Quraysh Allah selected the clan of Hashim and from the clan of Hashim Allah selected me. Now, how does, that, what, how does that translate? Allah chose Kinana from the children of Ismail. We know that the Prophet wasallam is from the children of Ismail And it was very beautiful. His father was Sayyidina Ibrahim So we know he is from the children of Ismail and, But the accurate and exact lineage and ancestry and the genealogy between Ismail alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is not absolute in the sense that there are many genealogies available, but the Islamic sources quite categorically and honestly state that we are unsure about the this genealogy between from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam all the way to Ismail alayhi salam. However, we are sure and confident of the accurate genealogy for approximately 20 generations before the Prophet ﷺ. That much we do know. So from the Prophet ﷺ all the way to Adnan, we know of that genealogy. But from Adnan to the Prophet Ismail ﷺ, we do not know. For sure, for certain. And if I can just quickly relate the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then I'll explain the meaning of that hadith. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. So Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn ibn Hashim ibn Abd Manaf ibn Qusay ibn Kilab ibn Murra ibn Kaab ibn Luay ibn Ghalib ibn Fihr ibn Malik. Ibn Nadar, Ibn Kinana, Ibn Khuzayma, Ibn Mudrika, Ibn Ilyas, Ibn Mudar, Ibn Nazar, Ibn Ma'ad, Ibn Adnan. So all the way up to Adnan, we know the lineage, we know this for definite. So what was uh, one of the names that I called out? From the children of Ismail, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? Inna Allah astafa kinana min walad Ismail. From the children of Ismail, Allah selected kinana. 
So all the ans and Kinana is part of the lineage here. Another Ibn Kinana. And from Kinana, he chose Quraysh. And who was the Quraysh? The Quraysh was a tribe, but who was their ancestor? After whom the Quraysh were named? It was Fihr ibn Malik. So Lu'ay ibn Ghalib ibn Fihr ibn Malik ibn Nadar ibn Kinana. So Kinana's son was Nadar. And as we go down, one of the children, one of the, ans- one of the progeny was Fihr ibn Malik. And I mentioned before that Fihr ibn Malik, his nickname, or he was, he was Quraysh. And Quraysh means little shark. So the Arabs, like many tribal societies, they had a tradition of keeping names related to animals. So Asad, lion. Fahd, cheetah, or, or Taif, cheetah. And you had Quraysh, which means, it's a diminutive, which, mean, of, uh, which means little shark. Just like the tribal societies of uh, the Native Americans, sitting bull, red horse, wild horse, etc. So the Arabs, these were tribal societies. They prided themselves in these names. I actually mentioned about uh, last week about Dihya al Kalbi, with whom the Prophet وسلم, actually sent the letter to the ruler of the Ghassanids, and he forwarded it to Heraclius. And I mentioned that he sent it with him. Why did he send it with Dihya al-Kalbi radiyallahu an? Because he was from the tribe of Banu Kalb. So sometimes people do hesitate. He was a Kalbi, meaning he was from the tribe of Banu Kalb. So is he actually Kalbi? Maybe it's Kalabi, Kalabi, Kilbi, but it doesn't mean dog. But it's actually Kalbi, because their ancestor was Kalb. And these were the Banu Kalb, known as the ch- ancestors of the children of Kalb. Now, Kalb doesn't just mean dog, wolf. That's what it meant, wolf. So these animals, chi- these are predators. So they, would, they, would, they liked calling themselves after predators. So wolf, lion, cheetah, shark the apex of the oceans. So, Quraysh means little shark. So, Dihya al-Kalbi radiyallahu an was from the Banu Kalb. Zayd ibn Haritha radiyallahu an was also from Banu Kalb. He was from the same tribe as Dihya al-Kalbi. So, Banu Kalb, again, animal. So, Quraysh means little shark. So, who was called little shark? This was Fihr ibn Malik. His name was Quraysh. And his ancestors are known as the Quraysh. And from the Quraysh, the Prophet ﷺ says, Whom, who did Allah choose? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the Banu Hashim from Quraysh. The, who was Hashim? I mentioned it, the same one who was buried in Gaza. So Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Hashim. So he was the Prophet Wasallam's great-grandfather. So, and then from the whole clan of Hashim, Allah chose the Prophet ﷺ. So that's the meaning of the hadith. Inna Allah astafa kinanata min waladi Ismail. Allah chose and selected kinana from the children of Ismail. From kinana, from the children of kinana, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Quraysh, meaning Fihr ibn Malik and the tribe. And from the tribe of Quraysh, Allah chose a clan of Banu Hashim. And from the clan of Banu Hashim, so Allah, from the Banu Hashim, who did Allah choose? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is the leader of mankind. He says in a hadith, and as Sayyidu Wuldi Adam wa la fakhr. I am the master and the leader of all the children of Adam. And there is no boast in this. For he truly is the master of mankind. So, and that's why even Abu Sufyan had to admit, huwa fina dhu nasab. That he's a man of great pedigree, ancestry, and lineage amongst us. He then says, "Al Heraclius then asked, فَهَلْ قَالَ هَذَا الْقَوْلَ مِنْكُمْ أَحَدٌ قَطْتُ قَبْلَهُ Has anyone 
ever said the same thing, i.e. made the same claim as Muhammad ibn Abdullah before him. So, Qult, Abu Sufyan says, I said, La, no. So what Heraclius wanted to know is, this person stood up and rose amongst you and claimed to be a prophet. Amongst your people, has there ever been a history of someone claiming to be a prophet? Abu Sufyan said, no, there isn't. And the wisdom of this question and the significance of Abu Sufyan's answer will become clear later on in the Hadith, where Heraclius goes through the questions again and goes through the answers of Abu Sufyan and explains each answer himself. So there was no one else who claimed prophethood. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rose. And not only the claim of prophethood, but what he was saying to them, no one else said it. It's true. What he said was immense. What he said was immense. It was great. It was radical. It was huge. Imagine. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Today, if someone tells you, don't eat this, do eat that, don't do this, do that, we become offended. Now imagine this in Makkah al-Mukarramah. The Prophet ﷺ did not rise and say to the people, that, oh people, maybe you should start avoiding this and avoiding that. The Prophet ﷺ didn't speak to them about food and clothes. The first thing that he rose with was, oh people, shun the worship of your gods. The first thing he said was about their gods, not about their clothes or their diet or their tastes, or even their wealth, or their practices amongst themselves, although that did come into it later. The first thing the Prophet ﷺ rose and said was, O oh people, shun the worship of your gods. Abandon the worship of your gods. Now that was a great message. Nobody had said that before. Nobody had dared to say it in such an open manner. There were a few individuals who shunned the worship, but they were unable to rise amongst their people and make a claim as great as the Prophet ﷺ. Heraclius then said, Qal, فَهَلْ كَانَ مِنْ آبَائِهِ مِنْ مَلِكِ So was there any king amongst his ancestors? قُلْتُ لَا Abu Sufyan said, I replied, no. And indeed, there was no ancestor who claimed to be a king. The Arabs were tribal, it was a tribal society. They were tribes. They were chieftains. But even the chieftains were considered equal. So, a Bedouin could approach the chief, chieftain of the whole tribe and speak to him as he wanted. Just as the Bedouin used to come to the Prophet ﷺ, and they dispensed with all the niceties and the fineries, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they never ever <laughs> proclaimed the Prophet ﷺ to be a king. They never addressed him as your majesty, as your greatness, your holiness. They did not treat him like a king. They did not give him the title of a king or an emperor or a ruler. But the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they would speak to him, they would begin and preface their words with the phrase, Fidaka abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah, that may my father and mother be your ransom, O Messenger of Allah. May they be sacrificed for your sake. But the Bedouin would come and they would just simply say, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad. Even those who eventually believed in him. 
even those who believed in him, because that was their society, that was them, uh, this was their manner. They were fiercely independent. And they did not believe in all this civility. That's why one of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, when he marched into the royal camp, he took his spear with him and he dragged it along, piercing all the cushions, and he spoke to Rustam the royal general of the Sassanid Persian army. And he spoke to him openly. He refused to bow. He refused to kneel. He refused to lower his head. Because he, these were the, 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 this is how they were. And when he left, Rustam even said to his others, he said, have you ever seen anyone more self-confident and of a greater self-dignity than this man? He didn't see it as an insult. He saw it as a sign of self-worth and self-dignity and self-confidence. That's how the Arabs were. That's how the, uh, in general, the Arabs were. So they did not believe in the civility and of bowing and prostrating. They just weren't like that. Bedouin would come and say, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad. So amongst them there was no ancestor who was a king. And again, the significance of this question and its answer will become clearer later on in the hadith. Then Heraclius said to Abu Sufyan, قال, So do the nobles of the people follow him or their weak ones? فقلت, so I replied, بَلْ ضُعَفَاؤُهُمْ Nay, their weak ones. Again, Abu Sufyan wanted to, uh, Heraclius wanted to know who are the followers of Muhammad? Who follows him? And remember, every single question of Heraclius has a purpose behind it. So he wants to know, he wants to determine whether this is a true messenger of Allah or an imposter. So he said, Who follows him? Who are his followers? Are they the Ashraf al Nas, the nobility, the gentry? The aristocracy, the great and good, or are they the lowly, humble, weak, impoverished ones? So Abu Sufyan said, nay, meaning the Ashraf, the nobles do not follow him, but du'afa'uhum, the, the lowly ones, the weak ones. Heraclius carried on to the next question. And indeed, who are the followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? This doesn't mean that there were no noble followers. There were many nobles. Abu Bakr radiyallahu an was a noble. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an was a noble. Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu an was a noble. These were all great people of the Quraysh. And Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu an was from the family of Hashim. And this was again from the core of the Quraysh. But many of the other famous Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and the majority, they were, the nobles were in a minority. The majority were people of humble origins, foreigners, slaves, freed slaves, the poor, the weak, the suppressed. Bilal ibn Rabah, Khabbab ibn al Arat, Sumiya and her husband Yasir, and their son Ammar radiallahu anhum ajma'een. They were impoverished, they were poor, they were weak, they were captured, persecuted, taunted, and actually physically tortured and murdered. The first martyr of Islam was Sumayya radiyallahu anha, the mother of Ammar ibn Yasir radiyallahu anhum. And there were many other Muslims, all from poor, humble, lowly families. Lowly as the others saw them. And this is the tradition of the people. Why? Humble people who are People who are humble, uh, people who are poor, P 
Paul and supposedly powerless, they remain humble. And humility gives clarity. Humility gives clarity. Their minds are clear. Their hearts are clear. See how loving, caring, affectionate and sympathetic poor people are. The poorest are always the most charitable. And survey after survey, research after research proves the point that the richer a person becomes, the more tight-fisted, the less charitable and the more stingy the person becomes. And in every society, modern and medieval, now and before, most charity comes from the lowest part of, and the lowest segment of society. Those who are poor, those who are looked down upon, those who are frowned upon, those who are considered worthless, they remain humble. And humility and humbleness create clarity. Clarity in vision, clarity in understanding, clarity in perception. And not just the clarity of mind, but also the clarity of heart. They are not mean-spirited. They are not stingy. They are not paranoid. They are loving, caring, and affectionate. Despite all our human weaknesses. And conversely, the richer a person becomes, wealth and power cloud a person's mind and judgment, and they create confusion. They cloud a person's heart. Wealth creates rust in the heart. Wealth and power create confusion and they cloud a person's judgment. And I've spoken about this at great length in some of the seers of the Holy Qur'an. And I won't go into all that detail here, but wealth and power create confusion. They cloud a person's judgment. Humility creates clarity. Not just of the mind, but also of the heart. This is why they were always the most receptive to the message of the Prophet Always. And it's a tradition of the Anbiya alayhim that the powerful and the nobility, the rich, the haughty and the arrogant, they rejected the prophets of Allah. And the weak ones followed them. And those who were arrogant, They said to those who were ustudifu, considered weak and oppressed, those amongst them who believed, that do you know that Salih has been sent by his Lord? Meaning, from the people of Salih alayhi salam, what was the story? The rich and the powerful, the high and mighty, they rejected him. And they even taunted the believers. And who were the believers? The lowly, humble folk. And that was a story with all of the prophets, والسلام, as I mentioned in my talk on pride and arrogance on Sunday. So do refer to that, I won't repeat myself here. But it's a story of all the prophets. والسلام, and that was a case with the Prophet والسلام, in Makkah al Mukarramah. It was the lowly and the humble and the simple who, with their clarity of mind, and the clarity and purity of heart were the first to embrace the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why he said, who follows them? The nobility? He said, no, not the nobility. Rather, their humble ones. Then Heraclius said, قال, أَيَزِيدُونَ أَمْ يَنْقُصُونَ Do they increase or decrease in number? قُلْتْ So Hira- Abu Sufyan said, I replied, بَلْ يَزِيدُونَ Nay. Rather, they increase in number. And the Muslims were increasing, slowly and surely. And what I said earlier about the impoverished and the poor being believers, the Prophet ﷺ wasn't promising them wealth. Some people tried to explain away this phenomenon by saying that the Prophet ﷺ was a social revolutionary leader. That's why he promised great things wealth and social change which attracted the poor, the weak and the impoverished. In their oppressed lives, they saw a glimmer of hope. So he was merely a revolutionary who gave them a false message of hope. And that's why they rallied around him. That's 
That's completely untrue. What benefit was there for the poor and the impoverished to believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Makkah al Mukarramah? He wasn't promising them any worldly wealth. And they were being tortured. What need was there for them to remain steadfast on their faith whilst they were being tortured? Ammar ibn Yasir radiyallahu anhu, his mother Sumiya radiyallahu anha, his father Ammar, uh, uh, Yasir radiyallahu anhu, they had been, they were a family of freed slaves. Sumiya and Yasir were both freed slaves of the Banu Makhzum. So even though they were freed slaves, now they were free people, they were still indebted to the Banu Makhzum. And the Banu Makhzum, the tribe of Khalid ibn al-Walid and his father who was a powerful person, al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. This was also the uh, tribe and the clan of Amr ibn Hisham, who was better known as Abu Jahl. So this was the tribe of Abu Jahl and al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, the most powerful clan at the time. They were the freed slaves of this clan, but they still continued to treat them like slaves. And they were the ones who personally tortured them. Abu Jahl personally tortured Sumiya radiallahu anha, her son Am, uh, Ammar and his father Yasir radiallahu anhum ajma'een. At that time, whilst they were being tortured, flogged, whipped, lashed all over the body, indecently assaulted in the case of Sumiya radiallahu anha, in the presence of her husband and in the presence of her son. The Prophet ﷺ unfortunately wasn't in a position to physically help them at the time. And he would pass by them. And he would tell the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to pass by them. And say, and he himself would pass by them and say, despite all of that torture, he would simply say to them, Sabran ya ala yasir, fa inna mawidakum al jannah. Patience, O family of yasir, for your promised abode is jannah. He wasn't promising them any wealth or deliverance on earth. He was saying, remain patient, for your promised abode is Jannah. What need was there for Ammar and his parents, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, to continue? Even many years later, when Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu an reached Medina after the hijrah, and the Prophet ﷺ was building the masjid along with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. This man, Ammar radiallahu an, had seen his own mother being killed in a very indecent manner. It said that Abu Jahl thrust a spear through her privates. And this is how she was killed. In front of her son and in front of her husband. Then her, his father died as a result of the torture. He saw both his parents being killed and tortured. He himself was tortured. After many years, he could have felt that all of this is a result of this man, Muhammad. Rather, he did hijrah with him. When he arrived in Medina and they were building the masjid, Ammar radiallahu anhu was carrying double bricks and he was covered all over in dust and the Prophet وسلم, stood by him and brushing off the dust of the body of Ammar ibn Yasir even then does he promise him wealth and deliverance in the world he's brushing him and saying to him وَيْحَكْ يَا Ammar, Alas, woe be unto you O Ammar how will it be when the rebel force shall kill you so this young man he saw his parents being killed and tortured. And now the Prophet is speaking to him about his own death. And prophesizing and foretelling him that you will be killed by the rebel force. So the Prophet did not promise them any worldly goods and gifts. He only promised them Jannah and things of the hereafter. And yet they believed in him. This wasn't a social message of reform that attracted them. This was Iman, which is a mystery. Despite being poor, weak and impoverished, when Iman entered their hearts, nothing could shake them. 
absolutely nothing. No one else could understand them. And Heraclius himself will explain the magical and mysterious effect of Iman in his own analysis later. And despite all of this, the torture, the murder, the persecution, the suppression, were they decreasing in number? No, rather they were increasing. And not only that, قال, and I'll end with this, قال, Heraclius said, فَهَلْ يَرْتَدُّ أَحْدٌ مِّنْهُمْ سَخْتَةً لِدِينِهِ بَعْدَ أَنْ يَدْخُلَ فِيهِ Do any of them abandon the religion after entering into it out of displeasure for the religion? Out of displeasure for the religion. قُلْتُ لَا I said to him, no. No one does. And that was true. Despite everything, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum would not leave their religion despite the torture, the murder, the persecution, the suppression, despite the impoverishment. They lost so much. But they would not leave their religion out of displeasure for the religion. Again, there are many more questions and many answers and the hadith continues but inshallah we will continue with the remainder next week I'll pause here may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in subhanakallahum wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk do continue to come invite others also the hadith is very interesting the Heraclius' analysis is even more insightful and more interesting than just the answers of Abu Sufyan at the time. So his questions were very sharp and to the point. And his analysis of Abu Sufyan's answers were very revealing. And a lot more happened and he said a lot more. Through this we learn about the Prophet wasallam. We learn about the early Muslims. We learn about the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. We learn about their faith, and maybe therein we can find some inspiration. So do come yourselves and invite others too.